Hi everyone, welcome to Refactor 2021. My name is Mecca and I'm here to talk to you today about a little tip that we call difficulty anchors. Now, one of the things that I do in my day job is I run a team of engineers, product managers, user experience folks uh, working on Google Play. And one of the things that's most important to us is career progression. Uh, we think that career progression is directly related to inclusion because it's directly related to retention. It's very important to help and make sure that we create an environment where it's possible for people to grow and develop in their careers. Uh, this doesn't just mean promotion and more money and that type of thing. It means improving, maybe getting more responsibility, uh, maybe getting more confidence and more satisfaction from your job. Now, each tech company is different. I've worked at Google, I've worked at Amazon, I've worked at startups that, uh, that I've started, I've worked at startups that I didn't start. Uh, and everyone has a slightly different philosophy about career progression. But most of them, most of the processes that I've seen implemented or that I've put in place have a couple of key elements uh, in common. And that is in order to develop, in order to show that you're ready to move to the next level, you have to put a few things together. One, you need the skills to perform at the next level. Two, you need the opportunity. You need to be given the opportunity to demonstrate to yourself and to others that you have those skills. And then three, when you have the skills and you get the opportunity, you have to perform. You have to put it all together and show what you can do. And then four, here's the last part. And this is the topic of our conversation today. You need to be recognized. Other people need to see that you've done one, two, and three. Now, unfortunately for underrepresented folks and underestimated folks in our industry, uh, four is a lot harder uh, than it seems. Uh, and it can be a very frustrating uh, obstacle to navigate uh, for people. And uh, right about now, some folks are thinking, wait, can't you just do good work and be recognized? Why do, why don't, why do we have to do extra things just to be recognized? Um, and a lot of folks really do believe that you can just do good work and be recognized. I am not one of those people. Um, let's take a look at a couple of examples, historical examples of just doing good work and being recognized. So this is Rosalind Franklin. Uh, she was a chemist and she discovered the double helix nature of DNA. We're all getting mRNA shots, or at least we all should be. Go get your vaccine. Um, but DNA, RNA, the single helix, double helix structure of the molecule, she discovered it. Um, she, she's, she's still waiting to be recognized for that. A lot of people don't know that she discovered it because the Nobel Prize for that uh, went to other people. Um, you know, some of you are here in Atlanta, Georgia, right? Um, Rosa Parks, right? Uh, a little lady who was just trying to take the bus home, didn't want to give up her seat and became an unwitting uh, figure in the civil rights movement. She never intended to be a civil rights leader. Uh, she was just trying to get home, right? And then Martin Luther King was able to come and, and make this big boycott and the civil action around her, uh, her, her serendipitous circumstance. Uh, except none of that is true. Rosa Parks was a civil rights worker for 10 years before Martin Luther King really entered the scene. She was doing civil rights organizing while he was still a student at Morehouse, right? Now she's uh, recognized in the civil rights movement, but her full contributions to this day, I still run into people that don't know about her true contribution. She's still waiting to be uh, fully recognized. Mileva Maric, a lot of people don't know who Mileva Maric is. Um, you know, the it becomes a little clearer when you see a picture of her next to her husband, right? Mileva Maric was Albert Einstein's uh, wife. My wife solves all my mathematical problems. That's what Albert Einstein said. Uh, there's this myth that goes around that Albert Einstein was not good at math as a child. That's just not true. He was a brilliant mathematician. He just wasn't quite good enough at math to do the research that he intended to do in terms of Nobel Prize winning physics. It was beyond him. And everyone knew that. People who went to school with knew that it was beyond that, beyond that him. He was a graduate student in physics 
Milena March was also a graduate student in physics, and she was way better at math than he was. He was more of an ideas guy. And she vetted all of his mathematical theories. Unfortunately, she got herself in trouble in school for two things. One, she became pregnant with Albert Einstein's child. Two, she argued with a professor because Albert Einstein was not going to get an assistant professorship job. And she upset the professor. He won. He, he got the, the assistant professorship. She did not make herself any favors. Um, and they ended up not letting her graduate. But everyone who saw Albert Einstein work, including their kids, saw that she was contributing significantly to his research. Quote, Albert Einstein, how happy and proud I'll be when both of us together will have brought our work on relative motion to a victorious end. A lot of her friends wondered why she didn't push for more credit for the work that she was doing. They're like, you're doing half the stuff. She said, with notoriety, one gets the pearl, the other the shell. She has other quotes where she said, it doesn't matter about the credit. I just want to see the stuff happen. I'm keeping copious information. I'm writing down my notes. And at some point, I'll publish my memoirs and I'll tell the world how much of it I did. Unfortunately, unfortunately, towards the end of her life, she needed to ask Albert Einstein for his permission to publish her memoirs. And he said no. She was financially dependent on him. So she couldn't, she was not allowed to do this by herself. She had to ask permission. He said no. He said, doesn't it occur to you that no cat would give a damn about such scribblings if the man you're dealing with had not achieved something special? If one is a zero, it cannot be helped, but one should be nice and modest and keep one's trap shut. This is my advice to you. To this day, her memoirs have never been published. To this day, it's controversial and it still upsets people. The very suggestion that she contributed to anything related to Einstein's work. But people, people still to this day think that if you just do good work, uh, it will be recognized. Her memoirs are currently in the estate of uh, the Einstein family, and they have decided not to release them yet. Now, I don't know what kind of just do good work and be recognized y'all are doing, but you could be doing work that contributes to a Nobel Prize in medicine, like Rosalind Franklin, or physics, like Milever Marich, or the Nobel Peace Prize, like Rosa Parks. And people will still not recognize you. You'll still not get credit for your work. So leaving it up to chance and not having it be intentional is not a strategy that I would advise. So what does it take to really be recognized for your work? Well, one, people need to know that your work is your work. And that work needs to be valued. Valued by your company, valued by your organization, valued by whatever institution that you're in. People need to know that your work is your work and that work needs to be valued, right? So, you know, when we talk about uh, that work being valued, well, how might your work be undervalued, right? If you're like, well, I'm doing great work and okay, I get it. You scared me. Like I got to make sure that people know that my work is my work. Well, then how could it be undervalued? Well, there's an interesting thing when people look at you and they don't believe that you can do the things that you say you can do, either because of your gender or your race, or a lot of times it could just be because of your education. Maybe you didn't go to a fancy school and they think that fancy schools are the, the thing that, that determines how what someone's capabilities are. Maybe you didn't even go to college. Maybe you're self-taught. Someone is underestimating your capabilities and you figure, you know what? I'll show them. I will do great work. And then they will have to acknowledge my value. So you do it, you do this great thing, but a weird thing happens sometimes. After the fact, after you've done the good work, your peers undervalue that work. They start devaluing it and saying it wasn't that great. And that leads to sadness. It's incredibly, incredibly frustrating. People start feeling like I can't, I can't, I can't win. And this is where people start getting upset and they leave companies and they say things like, I'll never get promoted here. And they say things that are just generally negative. And this is not something that is good 
for you. It's not something that's good for your company. Trust me, your company wants you to succeed. Your peers do want you to succeed. So if everyone, if everyone's so positive acting, why, why does this happen? Why does your work become undervalued? Um, I feel it's because of two very important things. One, we don't like to be inconsistent with ourselves. And two, self-reflection is very hard. We don't like to be inconsistent with ourselves and self-reflection is very hard. How do those two things come into play? Well, if someone doesn't think that you are that good and you do something amazing, there's, an, there's now an inconsistency in their mind. They have to resolve it somehow. One way to resolve it is to acknowledge, wow, maybe I underestimated this person. Maybe this person is better than I thought they were. That involves a lot of internal reflection that it's, you know, it's not a knock on people. It's just a hard thing to do, to acknowledge that, hey, I was wrong about this thing. Um, the second way that they could resolve this inconsistency is by saying, oh, well, well, then, then the thing they did, if the person's not that good and they did this thing, well, then maybe this thing wasn't that complicated. Maybe it wasn't that impressive. And that's the thing that's extremely frustrating for the people who are impacted by this, for the people who've just done something that they thought would get them that big promotion or that was really helpful for their team. And unfortunately, once you're in this situation, it's very difficult for you to talk your way out of it. You can't convince people, no, 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 I really am that good. And it was that impressive. It's, it's almost impossible for you to make that at that point. One, because there's already an entrenched perception that maybe you're not that good. And two, you're an unreliable narrator. Of course, you're going to say you're amazing. Of course, you're going to say that. Um, but that might not be fully factual. So if you're an unreliable narrator, who are reliable narrators? Well, people with institutional credibility, people with organizational influence. Unfortunately, that ain't you, right? Now, the thing is, is that even for them at this point, it's still difficult for them to make the case that what you did was worthy of praise. It's really, really difficult. So one of the things that we like to do is avoid this whole mess in the first place. We use anchors. Now, difficulty anchors are things that we do before, during, and after any large project that the people on our team work on. Now, the things that you do before is you identify the people who are going to serve as your anchors, the people that have institutional credibility that are known as hard graders, but objective graders. And this is a really important one. People that are known for having the capacity for self-reflection, people that are capable of self-reflection. Now, at different companies, this is phrased different ways. At Amazon, they might say someone is vocally self-critical. At Google, they might say someone has strong opinions that are loosely held. I, choose your favorite buzzword. But basically what we are looking for here is we're looking for someone who has known that if they are wrong, they have the confidence and self-assuredness to say, hey, I, I was wrong. I'm willing to change my mind when presented with the right data. These are the requirements for a good anchor. Now, what's not required is that they work on the same team or on the same project as you. It doesn't matter. You could work on one part of the company, your anchor, as long as they hit those other requirements, they could work in a completely different team, completely different part of the company. The only thing that's required is that they have this domain knowledge, right? So if you're an engineer, you want your anchor to be another engineer. If you're a product manager, choose a product manager for your anchor. Another thing that is not required is they do not need to be experts on inclusion. They do not need to be from the same background as you. They don't need to know much about inclusion at all. I would say they don't need to know anything about inclusion, but I don't believe that it's true that anyone should be completely devoid of any understanding of inclusion. They should know how to work with and talk to and collaborate with people from different backgrounds and different genders and different countries of origin and different religions. That should be table stakes for everyone who chooses to work in our industry. 
Now, when you have this anchor, there's a few things that you need to do. There's things that you need to do before you start uh, uh, working on the project, things you need to do during, and things you need to do after. For before, the most important thing is to explain the problem that you are solving to the anchor. You must explain the problem that you are solving. And you need to align on the complexity and impact. What I mean by that is you might think something is amazingly complex. The anchor might not agree with that. You need to get that alignment. So once you're both aligned on both the size and scope and nature of the problem and how complex it is and what the impact is, how how valuable is this to the institution or the organization that you're working on, right? Get that alignment before you start working on anything. If you do not get this alignment, do not start working on the project. The next thing to, while you're working on the project during is you must do good work, no excuses, just do good work, right? And keep good notes. Do not skip this step. Very important that you are very, very methodical. And this means you need to be transparent. You need to be transparent with the anchor about things that go well. You need to be transparent about things that don't go well, where your predictions were correct, where your assumptions were incorrect. Communicate everything. Do not try to sweep anything under the rug. Okay. Now, after, after you've worked on this and you've kept your anchor in sync with what you were working on, the same devaluing by your peers may start to happen. Again, people hate to be inconsistent with themselves. But here's the great thing. At this point, your anchor will come in and correct that devaluing. In times in my career, when this has happened, I have never had to even ask my anchor to come and do this for me. They see it happen and they step in if you've chosen the anchor correctly and you've kept the anchor informed. And the reason is because anchors don't like to be inconsistent with themselves either, right? They have previously aligned with you on both the complexity of this problem and the impact. And if after the problem is solved, someone says, well, it wasn't that complex or it wasn't that valuable. Well, now there's an inconsistency with them. They don't like that inconsistency either. But if you've chosen your anchor correctly, they, people know that they have this capacity for self-reflection. and They are not saying, no, 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 this work was really that good just because they don't want to be wrong. They're saying it because they're speaking from an objective viewpoint. A good anchor should be someone who is capable of self-reflection. In your company, there might be people with weird titles like architect or principal engineer or member of the technical staff. The people who say things like, well, that depends a lot. That's, that's who you should choose for, for, for your anchor. Right now, going back to sort of the things that we talked about that were necessary for you to, to demonstrate that you're performing at the next level, this tip doesn't improve any of your skills at your core job. It doesn't help get you more opportunities, or at least not directly. It does a little bit, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while. It doesn't necessarily help you perform the task better. Well, it kind of does. It the that documentation step that communicating with the anchor on a periodic basis kind of does. So it's a little extra effort, but it has a huge payoff. And this tip helps you with just this last step, just the be recognized step, but it is a critical step. And it is so much better than trying to advocate for yourself. That can just be so painful and frustrating uh, and I've seen that go really badly, uh, uh, badly for folks. This way, having uh, sponsors, having anchors to do this for you is a much better approach. Now, why this tip is so effective? One, it encourages cross-pollination in your org. Senior engineers from one part of the company start talking to mid-level and junior engineers from another part of the company. People start understanding different problem domains. And it's a thing that improves DEI at your company without people needing to become experts at DEI. We're all trying to help bring the industry along, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. People are working on projects tomorrow, right? This is a thing that is practical that actually helps. The other thing I like about it is that it works for everyone. I don't like the types of things where it's like, this is something special that we only do for 
black engineers. This is something special that we only do for women because those types of things tend to miss people at the intersection, black trans women, right? How many programs do you know at tech companies that do things specifically for that intersection? I don't know many, but it's an important intersection. It's one we should be focusing on. What I prefer is things that work for everyone. Get us complete coverage, right? And the, the other thing I love about this is that it increases retention rates. You show me someone that is happy with how their work is recognized, that doesn't deal with microaggressions, that feels that they get opportunities, and I'll show you someone whose retention rates are higher than most of their uh, people in their category at their company. And the other thing that I really like about this is we get some sneaky mentoring in there, right? So we talked about sponsorship a little bit, but sneaky mentoring, it is almost impossible to talk to a senior engineer once a month about your core work for six months or a year without learning something. Right? If you're talking to the person at uh, Netflix that, that started Chaos Monkey or the person at Amazon who's one of the first engineers on S3 or the person at Google that helped figure out how we were going to manage all these machines and Borg, and you're talking to them once a month about your project, they're snipping in little, well, have you thought about this? And hey, you know, when we did this, we made this mistake. Maybe you can avoid it. And hey, you know, this, have you considered this? Have you talked to this person? It's so subtle but you're actually improving as an engineer just by having these conversations about your core work in a way that doesn't feel contrived and it's a really tight and efficient use of time. You're also having these senior engineers get exposure to talented people from backgrounds that they might not ordinarily see. The other thing that's really powerful about this is we get pre-alignment with the anchor. We get aligned on if this is a really impactful thing. Now, I might work at a big company that has a search engine, and I might say, you know what? I have a great project that's gonna get me to principal engineer. You know, everyone likes to click on blue links. Well, it ain't blue links, green. Green is the color. Now, I'm gonna change that color to green on all our websites, and I'm gonna make, make a bunch of money. And an anchor might think, okay, that might, I don't know if it works, but if it works, yay, that'd be impactful. But I'm not sure changing some some of those CSS files is is gonna is gonna really you know meet the bar for principal engineer, right? Um, is there more to it than that, or is it, or is it literally just changing the hex value from from blue to green? Now you might think that's sad that the anchor is telling me that my project that I think is so amazing is an amazing project by the way um, is not that amazing, but it's not sad. It's good. Because we're getting that alignment before I put a year or two of my career working towards something that the company doesn't value, right? That pre-alignment, it cuts off that frustration at the pass. It gets ahead of it. And then the principal and I can talk about, or the anchor and I can talk about, well, what would make it more impactful? What would make it meet that bar for what they think a principal engineer uh, uh, is, is capable of. Um, extremely powerful. Um, and the other thing I really like about it is that everyone can be an anchor. Every single person watching this talk can be an anchor for someone, if not today, then six months from now, right? Six months from now, even if you just started at your company today, six months from now, you're gonna have six months on the new person, right? you are gonna be able to have a clearer picture than they do about what type of work is valued at your company versus what type of work is not valued. You are gonna be able to help people get pre-aligned. In the time that I've been doing this at Google, I've never once asked a principal engineer to serve as an anchor for a senior staff engineer somewhere else in the company and had them say, no, that's not something I'm interested in. This is a thing that works. And the people that have been linked up with anchors, their rate of advancement and their rate of development, I'm not just talking about promotion, I'm talking about their skills as an engineer have been accelerated as a result. So this is something I strongly encourage. Steal this, take it, use it at your company. Uh, let me know how it works out for you, what worked well about it, what didn't work, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.
Thank you.